Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be continuing our look at curvilinear structural forms. In particular, we'll be looking at arches. So we've already discussed cables and seen how they, uh, how to apply the general cable equation in terms of the moment generated by a cable versus its horizontal thrust. Um, and we're going to just look at arches and, and see that arches are really a corollary to cables, except being instead of a primarily tensile form, they are primarily a compressive form. So we will investigate uh, uh, arches from a structural perspective. We'll look at some of the historical advantages of arches, and we'll look at uh, some of the uh, special structural considerations that need to be considered when designing with an arch as a structural form. All right, so I think that's with that introduction, we'll go ahead and get started. So the thing I want to talk about today is arches. We're going down to the arches, so to speak. Um, the uh, topic today is the architectural and structural form of the arch. So again, the topic for today is arches. So we're going to talk about arches a bit qualitatively. We're going to investigate the forces uh, within arches. We're going to uh, introduce a few bits of analysis for them, and we are just going to discuss some of the structural and architectural characteristics of arches uh, as a form, and also some of their uh, advantages, disadvantages, etc. So, uh, I think everyone knows what an arch is, and you're going to see all sorts of badly drawn arches today, but uh, I suppose that's par, par, uh, par for the course. So, the type of form we're considering today, again, is the arch. And this comes in a few variants. You can have your, uh, if you have a simple arch, uh, an arch in a single plane is, uh, of course, just referred to as an arch, and there are many varieties of this form, um, and we'll discuss some of those. Now, if I take an arch and extend it, in case you're just not familiar with some of these terms, if I take an arch and I extend it deep into the plane, in other words, if I do something, oh yeah, kind of like this. Imagine if I stack a whole bunch of arches uh, back to back with each other. If I do that, what I end up with is the form known as the vault, which again is just an arch sort of projected into the page. And of course, we also have the 3D version of an arch, which is the dome. So the dome, another common and ancient architectural form. Um, but, uh, and it, which is, of course, more or less just an arch rotated about its own axis of symmetry to produce a three-dimensional form. Okay, but let's talk, let's start talking about the forces within arches. And there's a reason we covered these, uh, there's a reason I want to talk about this after we covered cables, and that's because there's a lot of similarities between uh, the forces within arches and the forces within cables. So let's consider this. All right, arches. So I want to look at just a single arch and investigate some of the forces uh, within it. So uh, let's look at just, again, a single arch and investigate some of the forces within it. And in fact, I may want to draw this actually so it's clear that this is coming down at something other than a vertical angle. So maybe something more like that and something more like that. Okay. So we have an arch, again, a poorly drawn arch at best, and we have a series of downward loads on it, probably a distributed load, maybe its own self weights, whatever uh, loads it's carrying, etc. Now, um, in order to carry this load, uh, in order to resist this downward load that is applied to this arch, uh, there of course needs to be a upward load 
or an upward uh, restraint at the supports. And you can have arches that have either pin supports, roller supports, or fixed supports. You can have any combination of the normal, um, uh, the normal idealized structural supports that we have. But uh, let's see what happens if I were to cut out uh, just this um, joint here. Imagine I were to cut out just that joint there. Well, if I draw the if I draw the arch as a uh, a line element, like this, you can imagine that if I am going to have a um, if I am going to have an upward force here, I need to have a force that is along the axis of the arch, and that's going to be at an angle like this, because again, it's coming in at an angle here, and because this is at some angle theta, that means we also need a horizontal restraining force. So, um, again, because of the, uh, the way the arch is constructed, we will have both a vertical uh, support force, but we will also have a horizontal force. And this force is very analogous to the, for the horizontal force. Uh, we saw that was created in cables, even when, uh, if, again, if you recall, if we have a cable, which is sort of just an inverted arch, in a tensile form of an arch, rather than a compression form, if we hang a variety of weights from uh, a cable, either loads or it's just or or just its own supported self weight, uh, we saw that there are, uh, in addition to the obvious vertical forces in a cable uh, required to keep the cable stationary, there in turn are also um, in turn there are also lateral forces are what we refer to as thrust, horizontal thrust. And we will use the same terminology here, except in the case of the cable, um, if I want, so the loads are pulling this thing downward, if I want to keep the cable in shape, uh, I need to uh, apply a tensile force uh, to keep the cable from collapsing in on itself. And uh, with, a, uh, with an arch, I need to apply an inward pointing uh, thrust force in order to keep the, the arch from just uh, collapsing uh, sideways collapsing outward, I should say. So we have this horizontal thrust uh, on the arch as it supports. And uh, an interesting thing happens if we cut this arch at a few different locations. So first, let's try cutting it uh, just at the mid-span and let's cut, the let's cut the arch at the halfway point and see what that free body diagram would look like. Well, let's look at the arch again as just a line element. So I would still have my vertical loads my same vertical loads, and then I'd have my vertical uh, restraining force and my horizontal thrust. But then in turn, my horizontal thrust would also show up uh, if, because there are no other horizontal loads on this uh, truss, I know that at that cut, there has to be the same horizontal thrust. Or if I uh, were to go and cut it, let's say a little closer, maybe halfway up the arch or something, if I were to cut that there, what I would see is something more like this here, and I would have uh, fewer vertical loads, and I'd have my vertical force here, and I would have my uh, horizontal thrust H, and I would also have my horizontal thrust H. And uh, of course, you would also have some uh, uh, shear forces here, but I'm concerned mainly with the thrust force here. What I really want to get at with this is that notice, uh, even if I cut it at the mid span or if I cut it, say, halfway up, I reveal the same horizontal uh, thrust H. So another way of uh, stating this in general terms, or way of stating this in general terms, is that the same horizontal thrust will exist at any point within an arch. So the vertical, uh, and this is assuming a truss is carrying only uh, vertical loads. So a general, uh, a general rule uh, if a truss carries only vertical loads, or sorry, not a truss, a uh, arch. Got my brain on arch on trusses apparently. If, gotta be grammatically correct, if an arch, 
uh, carries only vertical loads. It will have a single horizontal thrust at all uh, sections. Uh, horizontal thrust at all cuts slash sections. Uh, at all, maybe I could say at all points slash uh, cuts. Or all points or sections. So, in other words, no matter where I cut this uh, using the method of sections, no matter where I cut this arch to reveal internal forces, the same horizontal thrust will be revealed regardless of where I cut it. And so, uh, and the reason this is important is that uh, when we're designing arches, we need to consider not only the vertical loads that the truss, that I keep saying truss, I don't know why. Um, we need to consider not only the vertical loads that the arch is carrying, but the horizontal thrust. And we need to have a way of resisting that horizontal thrust. And there are a variety of ways to deal with that. And we will explore some of those today. Any questions so far? Okay. So, arches. So let's move on and look at some more items with arches. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, some advantages of arches. And I want to consider both the, this both in a uh, contemporary context, a modern context, and in an ancient context. So um, I don't know about y'all, but when I think of arches, I think of really old traditional construction. I'm thinking, uh, when I think of arches, I think of things like Roman aqueducts. I think of things like uh, Roman domes and vaults. I think of things like uh, Gothic cathedrals, you know, things like that. Your real, uh, you know, sort of ancient structures. So uh, what are some advantages of them? Well, um, from a structural point of view, one of the primary advantages of the arches is as follows. Um, advantages. And uh, let's see how I want to state this. Um, so the advantage, the primary advantage of an arch, especially from the point of view of um, traditional building materials, is that uh, the arch carries its loads almost entirely in pure compression. Uh, the arch carries loads in almost pure compression. So remember when we looked at catenary curves last time, um, and a catenary cable is in uh, a cat something like a catenary cable is in more or less pure tension, and so in other words, the tensile force within it is uh, the tensile force or the force inside the, the element is always aligned with the axis uh, of the member at that point, or in other words, the curve of the member the curve of this uh, cable, uh, the force within it is always tangent to the curve at any point. And in arches, a, a very similar type of behavior occurs, except of the primary forces being um, uh, tensile, they're going to be uh, compressive. So again, we'll have some restraining forces like this. And then, uh, but if I were to cut this at any given location, I will reveal some internal forces. And yes, the horizontal component will always come to H, but uh, the forces, the vertical and horizontal components of them, uh, will always sum uh, to something that is more or less along the axis of the member. So with a, uh, again, with an arch, 
especially if you configure it in certain ways, the forces within are uh, almost entirely uh, composed of compression, and that compression is almost entirely along the axis of the truss, or in other words, or the truss again, the arch. Um, I don't know, again, I do not know why I keep saying arch, or keep saying truss. Lovely, I guess the caffeine hasn't kicked in quite this morning. Anyway, so um, again, we have a compressive force that whose vector will continuously vary uh, more or less along the, uh, to be tangent to the curve of the uh, arch as a whole. Okay, so what are some advantages of this? Why would I want a uh, architectural or a structural form that is primarily compressive? What are the advantages of what are the advantages of this? Well, um, the advantage of this is uh, these advantages especially occur in um, more traditional building materials. So just for imagine, or just for a moment, imagine you are uh, sitting somewhere at, you know, 500 AD or 1000 AD or, uh, you know, really any time before, you know, 17, 1800 or so. If you want to build a building and you're sitting there at some year before 1700 and maybe even 1800, um, <clears throat> maybe even 1850 or so, but imagine you're sitting there and you are the engineer uh, charged with uh, uh, designing uh, the structural system for a building. And you're sitting there somewhere around, you know, before 17, 1800. What materials do you as the builder or an architect or an engineer actually have at your disposal? Um, well, think about this. Um, so let's think about material choices. And again, these are sort of uh, traditional materials. And again, this is, again, this is sort of traditional. Or another way, to another way to think of this would be like ancient materials. What things do you have that you can actually build with? Well, first of all, let's talk about what's out. <clears throat> uh, you can forget steel and iron. You can really just forget those right away. Um, these do exist. Steel that has been made for thousands of years, but it was made in very small quantities by blacksmiths. We had not invented... We hadn't yet invented the ways of making these in large quantities uh, cheap enough that you can actually use them as meaningful building materials. Although the Romans did use a little bit of iron reinforcement, but uh, not in sufficient quantities to serve as primary structural reinforcement. So you can forget anything like that. Obviously, aluminum isn't an option. We didn't even know how to refine that until, until the early 1800s. You can forget that. Um, uh, carbon fiber. Uh, yeah, forget that. That's not going to happen. Uh, or any kind of fiberglass composite. That is right out. So none of those are options if we are uh, talking ancient times. But what is available? What do we have? Well, um, there of course is always wood, which is a really good material. It works with both uh, tension and compression, and that's fine. Uh, but wood, of course, has the problem that it doesn't last forever. It does tend to decay, especially in pre-modern times where they don't have access to a lot of the same, um, a lot of the same preservative techniques and construction techniques that we do. So any uh, wooden house or wooden, wooden building will tend to decay over time. Although we do have examples of wooden buildings that have stood for many centuries, uh, they do require a lot of care to be uh, uh, to, to last over a long length of time. So what, material, what other materials do you have? Well, you have things like uh, stone, uh, masonry, mortar, and of course, uh, you even, if you want to go uh, much further back, you have Roman concrete. And Roman concrete is a fascinating topic that I could almost spend an entire lecture talking about, but, um, the key thing that I really want to get at with all of these materials is that they have uh, something very in common with all of them. And that is with all of these, these are primarily compressive materials. Again, stone, masonry, mortar, uh, even just pure concrete, these are all primarily compressive materials. In other words, what I mean by a compressive material is one that has a much, much, much greater uh, capacity to carry compression loads than tension loads. 
So uh, really, the only building material they had back then that could carry substantial uh, tensile loads was wood. And if they wanted to build any kind of sort of grand public building that they, uh, you know, wanted to stand for many centuries, they would tend to build, the, you know, the ancients would tend to build out of um, more durable materials like stone, masonry, uh, or in Roman times, concrete. But uh, it, again, if you're kind of building for the ages, you want to build with something other than wood, at least back then. And, but all they had, the only real durable materials they had, uh, were materials that were uh, primarily compressive rather than um, tensile. So um, I want to talk briefly about uh, modern concrete. And this will sort of actually, for those of you who are going to take uh, reinforced concrete in the next term, that will be a bit of a preview. So let's talk about uh, concrete and specifically concrete beams. So we can uh, contrast how we handle uh, uh, this sort of same problem today versus how you might handle things uh, in much more ancient times. Okay. So consider a contemporary concrete beam. And all of the concrete we make today is uh, reinforced concrete. So imagine we have a concrete beam. And we'll go ahead and just make it simply supported, because why not? And uh, as we know from basic mechanics, if I have this beam under any kind of loading, maybe under just a constant distributed load, for example. If I have this beam under constant loading, it, of course, is going to go into flexure or bending. It's going to bend like this. Again, go into a positive bending, um, something like that. And because of that, we're going to have both tensile and compressive forces produced in this beam. So the top will go into compression and the bottom will go into tension. So we'll have something like this, where we have a uh, compression at the top and tension at the bottom. Again, assuming positive bending. Now, this is fine for uh, if I was if this beam were just made out of wood or steel or any material with substantial with that has both, uh, both substantial compressive and substantial tension capacity, this wouldn't be a problem. However, with concrete, its, uh, it's tensile capacity, again, as we said, it is a primarily a compressive material. Uh, its compressive capacity, um, and I might say something like it's F prime C, and that'll be a preview for reinforced concrete, you might have something like 3000 PSI plus. Um, and then for tension, though, it might only be like 100 PSI or less. In fact, its capacity is so low that when we design concrete beams, we actually neglect it entirely and just treat it as zero. And we'll be looking at that for those, again, who are taking reinforced concrete next term. But um, so it is a material that primary that can carry substantial forces in uh, can carry substantial stresses and forces in compression, but almost no force in tension. So the way we handle this in modern times, of course, is we add reinforcement. Uh, if this is going to be in only positive bending, we will add some uh, rebar uh, in the compression, uh, sorry, in the tensile zone. And that rebar is integrally, is integrally cast with the concrete around it. And it is then able to carry all of the tensile forces um, necessary to keep this beam uh, in equilibrium. So uh, we, get around the con uh, we get around the problem of concrete's uh, very low uh, tensile strength by just, get, uh, si we basically sidestep the problem entirely. Instead of trying to like create some sort of special concrete mix that has, you know, substantial tensile capacity, we just sidestep the problem entirely and just use a different material for the uh, reinforcement and that carries the tensile forces. Now, again, we can only do this because of technology that was invented in the uh, 19th century and onward. Uh, namely, we figured out how to make steel in very large quantities. 
again, steel things like steel weapons have had existed, you know, for many, many, many centuries, all the way back to Roman times and before. But it was something that had to be made in very small batch processes by a blacksmith. It was very, very, very labor intensive and therefore expensive. Um, it wasn't wasn't until we developed some techniques in the 19th century that we could make steel in mass quantities that we could actually make it cheap enough to be used as a building material. So uh, another example of this would be something like a masonry wall. Um, imagine you have a masonry wall. Let's say you're doing like a Imagine you're doing like a masonry, a CMU wall, a concrete masonry unit wall, maybe as something like a retaining wall. So you have a hillside, you're building a little retaining wall, um, and actually probably shaped more, oh, something more like that, but whatever. I'll just treat it as a wall for now. So imagine we have a masonry wall. If you have a masonry, say a masonry retaining wall, uh, this thing is going to want, the soil behind it is going to want to put this into bending. So it's going to want to cause this thing to uh, bend over like this. And masonry, just like concrete, uh, and sometimes if you just have CMU, it literally is just concrete. But imagine you're building a uh, retaining wall out of brick. So you have your masonry wall. A uh, nice crudely drawn masonry wall like this. Oh, something of this form. And again, you are kind of bending this, uh, well, in, as this drawing would be, it would be into the page. And we handle this in a very similar way to what we do with reinforced concrete. We add reinforcement. If you have a masonry wall that's going to be under substantial uh, flexural loads, you can add ma uh, you can add steel reinforcement, just rebar reinforce, really, literally just the same reinforcing rebar that is used in um, reinforced concrete construction. And you'll sometimes see, you know, you'll sometimes see things like if you look at, you can buy bricks that have little holes in them, like this. And the purpose of those holes is twofold. One, it saves weight, and also it serves as a location where you can add uh, reinforcing rods and then fill them with grout uh, to produce a composite material if you're using, if you're actually using uh, masonry in any kind of uh, structural uh, applications. So, um, but let's think about how you handle this as an arch. Or what do you what do you do if you are in a, again if you are in a pre eighteen hundreds context? Well, if you want to span a large distance, you have a couple options. Uh, one, you can use wood, and that was certainly used in many locations throughout history. And again, it can be used it can, if you protect it right and build it right. It can stand for centuries, um, but it is never going to be as intrinsically durable as say Roman concrete or stone or uh, masonry, etc. Going to require a lot more maintenance and upkeep. And the answer, as you might have guessed, is of course the arch. So if you, uh, again, if you're in an ancient context where you have primarily your, your most durable materials uh, are all largely compressive, that is where the arch tip, uh, will, will really shine. Because again, your arch uh, is going to carry forces. You may have vertical loads applied to the, the arch, but these loads in turn will travel through it and they will be loading the arch primarily in compression. And that's great if you have a uh, if you are, live in a world where the where the most durable building materials are primarily uh, compressive in nature. And of course, uh, now the one problem with this, of course, is that you do have to resist this horizontal thrust. And this is something that uh, that you do need to consider when you're designing an arch, and it's really one of the uh, limitations on its design. So uh, let's continue. So let's look next at some ways you can actually resist this horizontal force. So there's a couple ways you can resist this. Uh, if you're talking a modern context, if you're building with arches in a modern context, uh, again, if you do not resist this horizontal thrust, again, 
uh, if you have loads applied to, the, to this arch, it wants to just expand outward and sort of flatten itself down into just a pile of rubble. Um, so if you want, so if you need to, if you want to keep an arch to actually stand, you need to provide not only a vertical restraining force to support it, but also a horizontal thrust force in order to keep the arch stable. So we have a couple ways of doing this in a modern context. Um, something we can do now because we have uh, steel and such is to simply add uh, steel rods at the base um, going from one part, uh, one root of the arch to the other. And this will want to expand outward, but it can't because we're not, we are applying a tensile force to hold it in place. Um, or if you're doing the three-dimensional version of an arch, which is the dome, say you're building a dome, Um, one thing you can add that you'll often see on modern uh, very large domes is a tension ring. And so what you'll, uh, uh, for example, some of the really big uh, sports stadiums, like think of things like the Superdome, uh, the Astrodome, other large uh, reinforced concrete domes. They're, those are really popular, especially back in the um, 60s and 70s. Um, you know, very large, uh, we've, we've built very large concrete domes that can span entire football fields, American football fields, uh, uh, obviously. <laughs> but I suppose uh, there have been many also for uh, football in the, a global context, football. Um, but the whole idea with this, uh, with this tension ring is that you will have a, a large, you'll have a, uh, a reinforced concrete dome that might span many uh, hundreds of feet. And to resist the enormous outward force uh, generated by that uh, or required to keep that stable, you will just have a large steel band going all the way around the dome at its base, and that tensile ring provides that horizontal thrust force that is needed to keep that arch stable. So, but, uh, and these are, this is fine for a modern context, but again, if you're uh, in the, in an ancient context, what do you do? You have, we keep coming back, we keep coming back to the same problem of we don't have in ancient times very good uh, t uh, tensile materials. And so I suppose you could make this kind of thing out of wood, but the forces within wood won't necessarily mesh very well with those in con uh, within concrete or stone. And again, the whole point of building out of this material is that we wanted to build something that um, would hopefully last a very, very long time. So, uh, and if we're building something out of, uh, if I am building a structure out of stone and going to that, that great expense, Obviously, a stone structure is much more expensive than a wooden structure in ancient or modern times. And so uh, if I'm going to all this tr trouble of using stone, I probably don't want to have a wooden cross member like that uh, necessary for structural support. So we need another way, if we're designing, again, in an ancient context, uh, we need another way of preventing this arch from collapsing. And... Uh, Thankfully, there is a method of doing that, or, or the ancients did figure out a method of doing that. And, uh, well, the method they chose was the brute force approach. So if you want to resist this outward force, again, the most efficient way to do it, especially in a modern context, is to use some sort of tensile element that will prevent uh, the arch from uh, collapsing sideways under the lateral thrust or for lack of lateral thrust. But if you don't have uh, very good tensile materials, then you're going to have to use the brute force approach. And this is how ancient buildings stood up, at least ancient arch buildings. And the way they did that, in case you're not familiar, you have your arch. And again, the central problem where we have here is that uh, the arch wants to expand outward. Uh, even, though, even though we're only applying vertical load to the arch, it wants to expand outward and uh, collapse using that mechanism. So uh, the way they did this in ancient times was to simply use the brute force approach. And what I mean by this is literally just massive amounts of dead weight. So you might have something like this. One way to support this arch, and of course this would be filled in as well, 
it would be all be integrally it all, would all be integrally made together. Um, so you just have a massive hunk of material, and typically this would be something like, oh, on a building this might be something like a brick wall, um, then filled with rubble, a brick or concrete wall filled with rubble. Anyth something just to be very, 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 very heavy. And if you just have massive, massive uh, weight at the edges of the arch, well, if this now if this arch wants to collapse, it needs to overcome the frictional force um, between these massive piers at the ends and the ground. And when I say massive, I mean massive. Uh, if you're uh, Perhaps the most famous example of an ancient arch or uh, vault or dome building is the Pantheon. Uh, the Pantheon, if you're not aware, is the, uh, is, I don't know if it's the oldest still standing concrete uh, dome building, um, but it's definitely for many centuries, uh, for, for actually over a thousand years, I believe it was like the most, uh, the widest span uh, concrete dome in the world. And so the Pantheon in Rome, originally built by, oh, I forget what Roman emperor, but uh, anyway, uh, it's been standing for about 2,000 years now, and it is a concrete dome. It is a concrete dome, completely unreinforced, and uh, it's actually very fascinating if you want to read up on it. But uh, this massive concrete dome, the way it, uh, the way the uh, outward thrust of the uh, large dome is resisted is by this method, just having very large uh, weights uh, on either side of the dome, which prevent it from uh, collapsing outward. And when I say massive, in terms of thickness on the Pantheon, these walls are up to, are over 20 feet thick. And the Pantheon is an extreme case, but they have, uh, they were built with uh, masonry and concrete walls, and then uh, filled in with rubble. And the whole point of these extremely thick walls, again, is just to serve as sheer dead weight. And that dead weight in turn will generate a massive frictional force between the ground and the walls. And because of this massive bit of inertia, uh, you're just using raw inertia to prevent the uh, dome from collapsing. And that is, of course, one way to do it, but uh, it's not exactly the most efficient uh, structural form. So, um, and... And they also figured out ways you could sort of do things like chaining arches together. Um, you probably are all you probably all seen at some point uh, images of old aqueducts and uh, uh, vaulted vaults and arcades and things like that, other classical shapes, where you will have uh, something like this, one arch abutting a uh, abutting the next. And each of these arches will want to expand outward, but uh, when you chain many arches together like this, you still need some massive weights at the end, but you only need them at the ends. The, the arches in the middle can be braced by the arches um, at the sides, and you only need two sets of massive weights, on, one on, or a set of massive weights, one on either end. And that is kind of a, a classical, uh, also a classical architectural form. So now you know why uh, the Romans liked arches so much. And incidentally, uh, although, although this is mat extremely materially inefficient, um, this is also why we still have some examples of uh, Roman concrete buildings. Uh, modern concrete, now, when you use, uh, when you build with reinforced concrete, but you know, you build concrete with steel, uh, the advantage is you can get a, you get a much more efficient structural form, uh, much more efficient use of material. The downside, however, is that um, because you, and it's more, mostly efficient because you can avoid these huge, uh, massive bits of dead weight. Uh, the downside is that steel corrodes. Um, when concrete structures fail due to age, it's not actually the concrete failing; it's the steel failing. It's the steel rusting and corroding, causing things like spalling and. Uh, uh, failure of uh, beams, columns, etc. But concrete itself is pretty dang stable. And so uh, they built forms that were primarily, almost entirely, unreinforced concrete. And because of that, they had, uh, while they did, while they, by their nature, needed to be very materially inefficient, they also uh, had a very, very, very long um, potential design lives. So a modern concrete building will typically have a you know, design life 50 years, if you uh, take good care of it, you know, I mean, if you take good care of a concrete structure, it can last indefinitely, depending on how much maintenance you're willing to put into it. 
But, you know, most concrete things like concrete bridges, if you get 50 years out of it, that's considered pretty good. Uh, we still have some bridges that are 100 years old made out of concrete, and that's considered um, not in dire need of replacement. So, um, but we have examples of Roman concrete bridges that have been standing for two millennia. And again, uh, they get that longevity uh, through not using re steel reinforcement. But uh, so that's their advantage. The downside, of course, is that they are very materially inefficient. So uh, pluses and minuses of building with unreinforced concrete. Also, the other problem with unreinforced concrete, especially in a place like uh, <laughs> Oregon, is that this is a, uh, we can say that, that these forms are very efficient uh, with vertical loads, but uh, not all loads are vertical. And especially if you have lots of dead weight, um, seismic load becomes very uh, difficult to design for. And so in any region of the world where you have uh, seismic forces, uh, arches have to be des uh, designing unreinfor with unreinforced uh, Concrete, for example, is not the best idea. And in fact, we actually deal with this a lot in Portland. There's a lot of old, um, you know, because we didn't actually discover that uh, Oregon is in a major earthquake zone until like the 70s or 80s, 1970s, 1980s, um, when we discovered the Cascadia uh, subduction zone and its implications for seismic loading and seismic events within Oregon. And so because of that, there's actually a lot of old masonry, un, old, uh, not just masonry, but unreinforced masonry buildings in a lot of cities in Oregon, and especially in places like downtown Portland. And that's a whole controversy unto itself and something you can uh, look into. There are a whole lot of buildings out, of, uh, out there that structurally, uh, the, um, you could not build today because of the seismic code. Okay, so next I want to consider some types of arches. And there's a few ways to classify arches. And just like things like trusses and beams, we can classify them according to their supports, to their support conditions. So the first one would be a, uh, a fixed arch. A fixed arch would be something like this. And again, a fixed arch would have uh, fixed supports. So not too bad, makes a lot of sense. Um, or you can have something like a, uh, a two-pin arch. A two-pin arch is one that is um, restrained by pins at the end. However, uh, these are both statically indeterminate. They're both very stable, but they are also both indeterminate. And again, this is referred to as a, uh, a fixed arch or a fixed supported arch. And this is a two pin arch. And then we also have the, if you, now if we want a statically determinant arch, we need to add another pin and typically you would add that at the center. And I we would call this a three pin arch. So something like this. We'll have a structural pin in the middle. Again, this pin will be able to transfer, uh, to transfer uh, horizontal and vertical forces but not, uh, but not a uh, moment at that location. And we would have pins at the supports as well. And actually I'd kind of do those as rollers, but let's go ahead and make them pins. Just to be clear that this thing isn't rolling away on us. And again, this is known as the uh, three pin arch. And uh, this is, uh, because we have this pin in the center, we release one of our unknowns and therefore we have a, uh, a statically determinant arch. However, this is still stable. It's not internally stable, but it is externally stable. It is stable as long as you have it. It is state, if you take this form of an arch and isolate it from its supports, it is no longer stable. 
um, it won't maintain its geometry, but it, but at least externally, uh, as long as it's connected to its supports, it is a stable uh, form. And there are all sorts of different uh, types of arches you can read up on. Um, things like the Gothic arch, which has kind of a, you know, your traditional kind of Gothic cathedral type of shape like that, or probably more like, oh, something like that. And, you know, there's Romanesque arches, there's uh, vaults and domes and barrel vaults and all sorts of things. There are, uh, we've been building with arches traditionally for a very long time. And because of that, there are many, many, many different uh, classifications and descriptions of them that you can read up on. It is a uh, really a fascinating field, especially if you kind of like, if you like uh, some historical, uh, if you like to investigate sort of historical building practices. Now, um... Let's consider this. I want to talk about the uh, angle of an arch. Uh, let's talk about the angle of an arch. And what, what I'm defining as this angle, this angle theta, is the angle from the uh, per, the angle produced by the line um, from the supports to the uh, center point or the to the apex of the arch. And uh, you, you maybe have referred to that point as the keystone. If you're building a masonry arch, uh, everything gets locked together by a uh, keystone at the center. Again, it is a very fascinating historical topic, but uh, it is um, primer, this is, of course, structural analysis, so we're going to focus primarily on the structural characteristics of arches. Um, but in, in addition to them having their, in, in, now, in addition to them being uh, traditionally used for their, um, their ability to carry loads primarily in compression, they also, of course, were used for their aesthetic value. I mean, they, they are a very elegant structural form. So what I mean by uh, angle, again, we can have arches that have uh, different angles. For example, you can have a shallow arch like this. And imagine drawing a line from the keystone or the apex to the root here. And the angle I'm talking about is this angle theta here. And this theta here. So you could have a shallow arch, or of course you can have a steep arch, kind of the opposite. Um, an op the opposite of this would be a very steep arch. Something like this. With this theta here and theta here. Uh, now, we could go through the derivation, but we're, uh, I don't know if we quite have time to work through the derivation, but the, uh, the text does have a full derivation for it. Um, but uh, I do want to mention the funicular arch, and that is one that is constructed in a way as that, uh, just like the catenary cable had uh, loads uh, in tension at every point along the uh, cable, the funicular arch is deliberately constructed to have uh, compressive loads uh, at every section of the arch. Um, is designed uh, for a single loading, for, a t for some loading. Uh, for some loading to have uh, internal, uh, to have only compression in direct, or to have only direct compression, I should say. In other words, it's only in compression, and it is uh, that compression vector is always aligned, uh, or is always tangent to the um, uh, always tangent to the curve of the arch. Okay, now and there are and so uh, the actual shape of that arch will vary depending on the type of loading. Um, so if you have a single point load, it would be like one thing, one shape. It would be if you had a distributed load, uh, say a uniformly distributed load, a funicular arch would be of a different form. Now, for a uh, a single point load, the funicular arch is actually almost not an arch at all. 
for a single vertical node, a funicular arch really isn't an arch at all, but just two rods. It is just two rods, two straight rods. So literally just a couple of rods with pins like this. You have a P there, then you'd have P over two, P over two, etc. Now, um, the book does have a full derivation. I don't know if I quite have time to work through today. Um, but the book does a really interesting analysis with this form and figures out uh, where the uh, maximum and minimum um, forces as you vary, in other words, as you vary this theta up and down, uh, you get different variations in total volume of material. So for very, uh, uh, for very uh, steep arches, if you have very steep arches, the force in the members uh, can become very small. Um, but in turn, as you get a very, very steep arch, they start get the members start getting very, very long, and they, uh, and so because of that, the, the total volume of material you need is very high. If you have a very shallow arch, um, the force is become the force uh, the maximum force becomes very 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 large, and so uh, in turn because of that you're going to need lots of material, and it turns out that when you work through the derivation, again uh, shallow arch, you have huge forces, uh, huge axial forces, therefore lots of material. Uh, lots of material. I can manage to write the word material. If you have a very steep arch, you have uh, very low forces, but also very long members. And because of those, uh, their great length, you then of course also have lots of material. But the key thing, and the derivation you can see in the text, is that if you want to know where the minimum material is for this type of uh, shape, or for this type of loading, a single point load, for that type of funicular arch, the, minim the, the minimum material, and therefore the most economic arch based on weight of material, um, the minimum volume of material, can be found when theta is equal to 45 degrees. And the book goes through the derivation, and you can uh, see that if you wish. But, uh, and that is, again, that's not for every arch. That's not for all types of arches. Um, it is the, uh, or for all types of loadings. But for the case of a single point load, it is possible to derive that the most efficient shape of an arch is two rods and those rods uh, positioned at 45 degree angles. Um, and the same type of analysis can be done for any given loading. Any given loading will have a, any given loading span, height, etc., will have a single arch shape that is most ideal. And we'll look at that, uh, and on Friday, we're going to look at the most efficient shape to carry a distrib uniform distributed load. Um, but again, uh, keep in mind, I, I want you to think about the, uh, until then, uh, make sure you really understand the difference between a steep arch and a shallow arch. A shallow arch has very, very high forces, um, has very, very high uh, uh, internal forces, and then um, because of that, it needs to have a very large material, and a steep arch is just very tall, and because of that, it has very uh, high forces within it. Or not high forces, very uh, just a very uh, large amount of material, as the members have uh, great length. And the optimum angle for this type of uh, single point load arch, it turns out, is at the balance of the two, which is at 45 degrees. All right, that'll do it for now. Please let me know if you have any questions. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'll try to get to those. Um, regardless, hope you found this uh, video interesting or a little, a little bit informative. Hoping you're walking away uh, with a little bit of knowledge on arches, including uh, some appreciation for their historical context and why they were uh, used more in historical context than in the present, uh, as well as some understanding of the, them as a structural form in terms of the, uh, the way that loads are distributed from vertical downward loads um, into uh, forces along the axis of an arch, and finally restrained by both vertical and horizontal thrust, 
uh, necessary to keep an arch in equilibrium. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Regardless, I hope to see you all again in the next lecture where we'll be continuing and finishing up on arches. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all then, and as always, thank you.